You'd probably have to be go with the flow to work with Matt that much. <laughs> oh, man. I know I'm getting a grilling on this. I'm just kidding. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, we kind of warned you, though. You knew this was coming. Yeah, but <laughs> if you knew David. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's, that's what I'm <laughs> about to say. It's like you don't know me. <laughs> Being with your change log is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. Linode is our cloud server of choice. Grab the Nanode plan for just $5 a month. Just 5 bucks. That gets you a gig of RAM, a blazing fast 25 gig SSD, and one terabyte of transfer. Let's be honest, you can go a long ways on that five bucks. When you do need to scale up, their prices are predictable, so you can put your calculator down. You won't need it. We've been running changelog.com on Linode for years, and we've always impressed by their award-winning support team. Check them out at linode.com slash changelog. Once again, that's linode.com slash changelog. Let's do it. It's go time. Welcome to go time. Your source for diverse discussions from around the go community. Next week on the pod, databases are back, baby. This time, the panel focuses their attention on Postgres. With special guest Johan Brandhorst. You may remember Johan from episode number 101 on security for gophers. If not, go back and give it a listen in our archives. You can find them at changelog.com slash go time or just scroll down a ways in your podcast app. You'll find it. Okay, let's talk go in production. Here we go. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Go Time. Today, I am joined with David Hernandez. David, you want to say hi? Yeah, hi. Matt Ryer is also joining us. Hello. And Johnny Borsico is back. I am back. Here is Johnny. Welcome back, Johnny. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a little while. It has. So today, Matt gets to join us on the other side as somebody we're interviewing. So we get to grill him. Are you ready for this, Johnny? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not meant to be sinister. It definitely is meant to be sinister. <laughs> it's not supposed to sound sinister. <laughs> Don't worry, Matt. I'll back you up a little Thanks, bit. Thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. Yeah. Good to know you're here. <laughs> but David, you sent me the email of all these questions I was supposed to ask. <laughs> Yeah, I counter back. Yeah, okay. Okay, so today we're starting what I think is going to be a somewhat regular series. Um, we're going to look at Go in production. So we're going to spotlight the Pace.dev app, which is what Matt and David have been working on. And it's the whole back end is written in Go. Am I correct with that? Yes. Yes. Okay, so we're going to be talking about that, asking them questions about their development process, you know, what architectural patterns work for them, what database they're using, pretty much anything and everything that might be interesting to our listeners. So I guess to get started, the first thing I'd like to ask is when you guys started out with zero lines of code, you, know, you have nothing, um, you just have this idea, what is the first thing that you started to do? Or more specifically, like what did your first build do? I don't remember. Do you want to go ahead, Matt? Well, I remember in the very beginning, we're very sort of quick to prototype stuff. So we like uh, whatever's going to help us kind of get ideas out of our heads the quickest. This is why like, I used to like Rails for the same reason. And, you know, the, the Buffalo project is kind of the Rails equivalent for Go. But what we wanted to do was, I think, just try and get some data being transferred. We knew some of the technology we were going to choose so we wanted to prove that out and get that working. And that involved building some real things quite quickly. So, yeah, I think the first thing was just a simple Go binary that served uh, HTML. And then we worked on originally, I think it was a view front end that we were serving through that main Go in the, initially, that main Go file. And then we changed it to Svelte later. But it's the same mechanism where those static assets are served kind of at dev time, at least through the binary. So first question I have for you is that uh, if you've just raised a good point of, of sort of using a framework to sort of help you get off the ground um, and do a prototyping quickly, but uh, uh, in this case, you, you went a different route. I'm wondering sort of uh, what sort of caused you to not use a framework, right? Well, why did you go sort of a standard library, sort of bare bones kind of style? 
Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, for me, it's really about what we know. We wanted to be productive as quick as possible. So we just picked the things that we were the most familiar with. If I'd used Buffalo enough before, I could easily have uh, started with that and got that going to sort of start to test out the ideas and things. But for us, yeah, it was just familiarity. We knew Go quite well. Uh, We know the standard library quite well. And initially, we didn't have very high demands on what the Go side needed to do. It really had to, you know, it's the business logic and it connects to the data and it's a set of services and things. But that's quite easy to do. Really, it's the same, whatever you choose, I think, for those sorts of things. So it just kind of made sense for us to start there. So you said that you had some technologies that you knew you wanted to use. And I assume this was before you'd built anything. Was this because you thought they'd be a good fit or was it because something you were interested in learning about? Or how did you like how did you have those technologies you knew you wanted to use? David, I mean, we started it was App Engine, wasn't it? Was something we decided quite early. Yeah, we were quite successful with App Engine before. We were using it for a while. And it's kind of the original serverless platform, isn't it? So we were quite happy with the results in previous projects. We thought, oh yeah, well, why not? What's the, the main decision? How are we going to deploy the backend? It was perfect for us before. We didn't have any problems. We didn't have to maintain any servers. They simplified it a little bit the last year or the last couple of years. So it's just, it just go. It used to be a, like a fork or something like that, that they customized and it was a little bit different with some weird stuff, but now it's just plain go that you can run standalone on App Engine. So it was quite easy decision for us just to make a binary and deploy it in, in App Engine. I'm picking up a theme here. Obviously, the sort of your approach to your architecture, your approach to what tools to use and not use, what framework to use or not use, um, how to deploy and, and basically not taking risk on things you weren't familiar with, right? Basically, in your case, it was a very deliberate decision to go with uh, um, things you already understood, things you knew would work well because of previous experience. It wasn't that, you know, another uh, um, platform or vendor or or framework or whatever it is would or would not have made things easier. You went with what you knew, right? So that was the sort of the greater uh, sort of uh, that carried more weight, right, than sort of going with whatever the latest hype is, right? Hey, this framework will make your life, uh, you know, easy or this platform will make your life, you know, easy, right? Sometimes going with what you know already to be proven to have worked before is just as good a decision they're going in that direction. Yeah, absolutely. And I tell teams this when I talk to different teams as well about their, when they're choosing their technology. That's a big thing. You know, gRPC, for example, might be the perfect choice from, from a purely technical perspective. But if nobody on the team has experience with gRPC, then there's a learning curve there. And some people talk about them in terms of innovation tokens and things, you know. You're not allowed they say to just all the technology can't be new and unfamiliar. You can do some of that, but there's effort and there's kind of a cost to being productive in any of those. And we had that already on the front end because we hadn't done much front end work for a while. And we knew we wanted to use a, it was going to be a rich front end. So we knew it had to be somewhat of a modern framework or something, some modern take on front end UI. It couldn't just be static HTML we thought wouldn't give us the user experience we'd want to deliver. And even basic jQuery and things, you know, you can quickly get in a difficult state, particularly around things like state in the front end. And I've done that before where I'll keep the front end ultra simple. It'll just be bits of jQuery or something just for the places where I want it to be dynamic. And then the rest of it's dead simple. And ultimately, for me, I want the front end to be like the best it can be. And so you're better off, I think, still writing rich a rich front end that can be a little, you know, you can have a bit more control in the front end there and things. So there's already a learning, we knew we'd, there'd be learning for us there. So we didn't want to also have learning on the back end. You know, we almost wanted the back end to be a given for us since we've been writing a lot of Go for a long time. Do you think that's part of the reason when people switch to Go from like a language like if they're using Python and Django or if they're using Ruby and Rails, 
Do you think that's part of the reason that they struggle is that if they're not using a framework, there's not only the language to learn, but also all the aspects that the framework provided that are, you know, basically they're, they're burning up a lot of innovation tokens all at once. Yeah, it could be. And similarly, you might decide learning a framework is the best way to spend that because if that framework is then going to do exactly what you need it to do, if, if the framework really fits well with what you're doing and you're not going to be fighting it, then maybe it makes sense in that case to throw your weight behind the framework, really learn that framework and become good at doing what it does. But of course, anytime you choose a framework, and this really applies to any time you sort of make a choice about any sort of foundational technology, you are necessarily constrained at the same time as it gives you things that, you can't, that you'd have to build otherwise. Similarly, it makes decisions for you as well. So if control is something that you really care about a lot, that's another argument against using frameworks. Um, you know, you have more control if you've written the thing yourself. And you can focus only on writing the bits you need as well. Whereas the framework, of course, is generic, general purpose. It's built for more users than just you. And so there's going to be a lot in there maybe that you just don't even need. So we didn't have that problem either. We, we were able to pick the problems that we wanted to go after and then focus and build only the bits we needed or that we felt we needed. So it's always interesting when, when you talk to teams about sort of decisions made. Obviously, the two of you have worked together before and you sort of uh, know each other in terms of uh, so your, your propensity to, to go one way or the other on whether it's architecture or technology. I'm wondering sort of uh, um, were there any in terms of, you know, in initially in terms of, you know, design and how you were approaching solving this, this problem and creating this product. Were there any sort of strong feelings for one thing over another that uh, perhaps one of you sort of really felt like you needed to go sort of go a particular way? Like I'm trying to understand sort of uh, if, like all teams, right, you had certain sort of uh, some some friction right between certain decisions, architectural or otherwise. Yeah, we have frictions every day, probably, isn't it, man? <laughs> it's like every day is a friction and battle. Um, I like this this way, I like this the, the other way. But at the end, one of the things that we constantly do is run little experiments. It's like very little experiments that you can throw away in a few hours or a day. Whatever Matt or I do something, stand alone because most of the time we are praying. We try to prove the other one wrong. It's like this kind of thing. Like, oh yeah, Matt told me to this probably is not a good idea, I'm going to prove him wrong. And I just do it and say, oh, look, look at it. It's working. Oh. And he's usually wrong, right? Of course he, he is. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm also 90% wrong. So it is, it's also a good, <laughs> a healthy. Yeah, it's like argument-driven development. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, but it does serve a good purpose, though. I mean, to be honest, when it comes to tech choices, I don't know that there were any of that any of those kinds of frictions, actually. But when it comes to things like um, abstractions, right, when we can see, this is something that we talk about all the time, but basically, early abstractions are very dangerous. And so we tend to pick each other up when we notice we're, we're sort of reaching for an abstraction and we feel like we're not ready yet. That one definitely happens a few times where we yeah. will instead choose to duplicate it and not build the abstraction first and see, you know, so we understand the problem a bit more. A math abstraction killer is like, Matt tell me, oh, I'm, I found this problem again and again. Shall we do an abstraction? No, Matt, no, no time for abstraction right now. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't ever. The next day he has again, um, maybe he has a better chance, but yeah. <laughs> do you have an example of something that you recently went to do that you decided to copy over? It happens quite a lot in the front end because we have a little bits of functionality that we find repeating again and again. One example is the waiters we have in the front end. So this is we should focus more on the go side, I suppose, but let me just tell you this quickly. So you get like a spinner in the browser when something's loading, when some data's loading, and we use uh, an integer to basically count the number of operations that we're waiting for instead of just a Boolean to say whether the spinner should be visible or not. And that way you can actually have, say, three requests going 
you know, depending on what the user's done, maybe they've clicked things in a certain way that encourages three requests to be made. And then that counter can count up to three. And, you know, in the finally block, as these promises are being filled, as these requests are being fulfilled, we then decrease that counter. And that allows us to show the spinner while until all the data is ready. And only at the end, you it's kind of like a wait group in Go, actually. That feels like there should be an abstraction there. That's something we do again and again and again. But in practice, in code, it's just an integer and then a few places where you increase and decrease and things. And so it would be more complicated if that was an abstraction. Because then imagine looking at that and forgetting like what that was and then having to try and go and learn this complicated counting system for things rather than when you can just see it in the code increases and it decreases here. In the back end is security. We have a lot of code to check. Well, it's a product management tool. So you have like orgs. So we have all over around check user is in org. Check user has permissions to write a message to a card in, a, in an org. Because the permissions are not very complex yet, we don't have a really clear abstraction for, for permissions. So every time that we do something that we need to assert what the user is or what is the user allowed, we just repeat the code to check permissions one over again. Maybe one day we can do a middleware or something like that that organize better permissions and we refactor most of the code. But until now, we didn't find a better way just to copy and, and paste the permission check. Yeah, so he's right. There's about 10 lines of code almost at the start of every one of our service uh, implementation methods that does the same thing. And of course, a couple of times it'll break the rules. You know, if we'd made an abstraction early, then the next time we needed it, probably suddenly you could make this request, even if you're not in this organization, for example, which happens, things like signing in and stuff like this. So yeah, it is kind of the most valuable lesson, I think. And it feels like the code feels bloated, doesn't it? When you look at the code and you keep seeing the same things repeated, we get a bit obsessed with wanting to dry that up. And I think mm-hmm. that's that's worth resisting. I'm interested in sort of how that sort of plays into the flat folder hierarchy you've chosen to sort of adopt, right? So because when you're thinking of abstractions, I think sort of how your file system looks, how you break, you know, how you have your folders and your files and the naming and all that stuff, that also plays a role in, in how you think, right, of your abstractions, right? So having a flat folder structure where you have all your Go files and the only thing that's really driving sort of uh, um, where you look for certain representations of concepts within the product, right, is based on the name of the file itself. But what came first? The one thing to stay away from attractions or is he saying, hey, like we have a flat folder structure, therefore that's going to impact how I think about my abstractions? A great question. I actually think it all comes from that being a little bit allergic to these abstractions because we've done what everyone else has done and junior developers will do, which is We've again and again built abstractions that were wrong, or we tried to structure, like we put everything related to comments in a comments folder. And then if you want anything to do with comments, you import that comments package in Go. So that seems completely reasonable. Until then, suddenly you need that comments service. You need to be able to send comments from a different part of the system that you didn't think about before. So now there's a new dependency between that and some other package. And actually we've in the past just tied ourselves up in knots with this and have difficulties with pulling out anything common into a different package so that they can both then import, you know, trying to solve that dependency and avoid cyclic dependencies and things like that. And it was quite a headache. And the benefit felt like we the only benefit you'd get is it looks neat in Finder or it looks neat in the file list. So if you can sacrifice that this is what we do. We have an API folder and all of our services are just in that one folder. So there's no question now if if we're going to add a new service, where does it go? It just goes in that same folder with the rest of them. And I think it probably looks quite naive. Like a junior developer wouldn't do it like this because of how overly simplified it is. And we don't think it's necessarily going to stay like a completely flat structure forever, necessarily. We just don't know what that structure should be yet. So we're waiting until that's more obvious before we start to break this thing up. It's not true for everything. 
some things are just as a concept completely separate. But within our system, especially given the way that different things interact in any sort of sophisticated system, there are no clear lines between services. We just went for something simple and had basically public facing services and internal services. And that's more or less it. Yeah, the only time that we ask ourselves uh, that if this should be a podcast is when we think, oh, is this something that potentially we can make open source and people contribute? That's why when we start, oh, that should be an independent podcast that we use externally so we can make it better, potentially release open source and other people contribute. And I think that's the only time that we really try to ask ourselves harder if, oh, this should be self-contained or should be not. Otherwise, it's just go to that uh, that folder. So is that what led to auto and outsourcing that? You sort of uh, saw this sort of pattern emerge or uh, out of a desire to keep your um, front-end communication, your back-end um, sort of how you respond to that. I'd rather keep that as simple as possible, right? You, you came up with auto. I'm interested in sort of diving into that a little bit and and understanding what makes auto different from um, perhaps traditional approaches or more complicated approaches. Um, if you were doing sort of a full-on RPC style APIs, sort of what led, why did you go to the, the simple you know, um, sort of route uh, with auto? Yeah, that's a good question. So the auto project, the problem we had is we wanted to have the front end in the browser communicate with the server. So naturally, in my history, I've used mainly REST services and JSON services and things over HTTP. And when we were looking at this, we we started with gRPC. We started looking at gRPC as a way to have this communication. We were limited a little bit because App Engine at the time may still not let you open any ports you want. You have to sort of stick to their rules with the port. And of course, gRPC servers like to open on a separate port and it's a kind of binary connection. It's different sort of thing. So we didn't have that. I couldn't do that in our deployment at the time and maybe still can't today. So the, and the other thing was with gRPC, because we wanted to generate our own code, we wanted to generate our own server stubs and clients, you know, for JavaScript and for Go and other languages. We started to look at how to do that using gRPC. And essentially, you have to build these plugin tools, which themselves are very complicated. And you sort of have to know gRPC in order to be able to do them, because they dog food gRPC. They actually take a gRPC message it through standard in. That's how the plugin architecture works for the gRPC toolchain. And we just couldn't get it working. It was just too hard, frankly. And all we wanted was to be able to have a kind of RPC back and forth between the client and the server. Yeah, what's funny because uh, the proto buffer definition, we were looking at it and it's a uh, to Matt, oh, this look a little bit like Go. If you remove some things and put some things, it's just exactly like interfaces, isn't it? So what about if instead of using proto buffer, we just use interfaces for generation all the code, like the back end, the front end? And I think Mike did it in, in like a weekend or something like that, these kind of things. He didn't have to prove me wrong that time. I, I was agree with him, like that could be a good, a good approach. So he did like the basic prototype to just generate code from that interface. We, we put it together, generate some templates, and I think it's a really cool project. We really like it. It kind of grows with, with us in, in somehow, that that project. And it's, it's, it's perfect for us because it, it brings the best of both worlds. It, it gives you a fixed interface like gRPC does. It's just an, a, a definition file, in this case in Go. But also the code that you generate it's really readable. It's, it's really nice. And the templates are very readable. So, And the last thing is the, the browser is just JSON. So you can debug it with your usual tools. You can see what's coming in, what's coming out. So it's kind of a perfect fit for us. So we are quite happy with that little project. So you weren't trying to emulate uh, um, gRPC, basically. You, you wanted to you get some ideas from how sort of it works. And you stole some 
and I use that very generously. You stole some ideas, some some implementation details, rather, and, sure, and no. you sort of issued the whole you know binary uh, um, format. You just went you're playing JSON, and basically you, you solved your own problem in a sense, and, and, and rather than sort of bringing in something for the sake of because it's cool. Yeah, it's, it's stealing from open source is not really stealing, isn't it? It's just, <laughs> it's just kind of Robin Hood wise, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, no, I was gonna I was gonna say, so the thing about that is the Oto project gives you these templates uh, for you to use, but actually the power is in you writing your own templates. That's actually the key point of it, because we did do a JSON HTTP implementation, but actually there's no reason why that has to be the only way to do it. You could actually generate protobuf files and, and go down and have that as well, have that whole sort of tool chain as well. We probably wouldn't want to do that, but there's no limit to what we can create. Somebody wrote a, a Rust client template, for example, uh, as part of the open source project. So yeah, it's about, I think, solve so solve just what you want and also don't sort of tie yourselves in. We didn't tie ourselves into anything. We can still use a binary protocol. We can do different things in dev and in prod because we just control everything. It just means you have to do everything. But if you can keep the scope small and keep the tech simple, that is achievable. And you end up basically with building little vertical slices of just the bits you need. And it gives you the most control. There's no sort of heavy trade-offs that we have to make. You know, we just have to invest in doing the work if we want features that aren't there yet. This seems like a pretty common theme in Go is the, instead of looking for a library that does all these things, see if you can just build the small version that you need. And I think one area where it comes up is like migration tools. So like if you need something to handle your database migrations, if you're coming from Rails or Django or something, it's very common to have all of that built in, like every possible variation of it. So were there other aspects of your application where you felt that was the case? Like, did you have to write custom migration tools or did you have to do anything else sort of like this where you built a small tool that people might expect to sort of exist? We did for our testing because the way that we do testing is again kind of quite different i think as a result of how we've been working for so long but yeah so we use the go test we use the built-in go tester for integration tests but we i mean sorry for unit tests but we have these integration tests which actually use the generated client that hit our real auto endpoints and it's just go code that you know, reads like normal Go code because you're just calling these methods. They're RPC methods, but they just, you know, because we use the Go client, they just look like real strongly typed methods and things because they are. And so we, we use that in our test code to make the real calls. And, you know, in order to do that, we need to spin up the, uh, the data store emulator. We need to have the actual app itself running for us to hit against the you know the rpc calls and so we built a little tool that does that a few things it spins up a few services you know it cares about it worries about the environment and things not too much the tool itself calls go test with a special flag to then go and run all the uh, those tests so that's one case and i think the blog's probably the other one where we chose to roll our own uh, where you'd you wouldn't expect that i think given that there are tools like Hugo, which is kind of static HTML site generator. You know, if you can learn something like that, it's probably a great choice. But again, we wanted the full control and our use case was relatively simple. So we wrote a blog tool uh, ourselves as well. And it was another one of those that it was kind of done in a weekend or just a few days, you know, we're taking a break from pair dev, one of those little side projects. What's up, Gophers? Are you having trouble visualizing bottlenecks and latency in your apps and not sure where the issue is coming from or how to solve it? Well, with Datadog's end-to-end -end monitoring platform, you can use their customizable built-in dashboard to collect metrics and visualize the performance of your Go applications in real time. Datadog automatically correlates logs and traces at the level of individual requests, allowing you to quickly debug your Go applications. 
Plus, their service map automatically plots the flow of requests across your app architecture so you can understand dependencies and proactively monitor the performance of your apps. Start your free data to drop the day to start monitoring the performance of your applications. And listeners of this podcast will receive a free t-shirt once you install the agent and create one dashboard. Visit datadog.com slash go time to get started. Again, datadog.com slash go time. So I'm interested in, in diving into sort of this whole testing story as well, because normally I'd be thinking, you know, okay, I need to containerize all the things, maybe use Docker Compose to get all these services talking to each other. You know, you start to basically add all these sort of uh, layers of complexity, right, to your testing story, right? And basically, you do a local development, especially if you have sort of a much larger project where you have maybe you have microservices, nanoservices, whatever new service thing we come up with and you keep adding these layers on right to, to try and replicate right production so in your case you're talking about okay i have a front end and i have a back end and i have a data store right those are your three pieces that you care about right so what does your testing sort of uh, infrastructure look like are, are you running everything sort of on your local on local host are you packaging things are you using docker are you containerizing are you orchestrating like what are you doing it's basically everything local. It's just the, the Go binary serves also the static files in, in local. For the data store, we are using Firestore. It's like the database from Google, from Google Cloud Services. So they ship an emulator. So in, in local for testing, we can spin up the emulator, run the, the battery of tests, tear the emulator down. So it's quite quick process right now. It's less couple of minutes less than a minute, I guess. It made me grow with the timeline. It becomes a problem. But right now, it's not containerized. We just run it in local, might run it in his machine and run it in mine. At some point, at the beginning of the pro- project, we we put a continuous integration thing in, in also in gcloud. But we didn't use it at all. We were just doing it more in local than we try to do it in in continuous integration. With probably with two people, you don't have the problem. If the thing grows more, we're probably gonna be back to that situation that we need to have something in continuous integration. But right now, it's just not necessary. The, today was the first time that I was deploying in production, and Matt was deploying also in production, and I get an error like, "Oh, someone else is deploying." So. <laughs> <laughs> who else could be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right there. I think team size means lots of things are easier, actually. So, you know, some of the decisions we've taken, I don't think you would necessarily take if you were in a larger team or a bigger company with lots of teams. You know, I think the the situation, the structure that your organization is in, I think that has a lot to say on those kinds of decisions about tech and and what you can do because it, those problems get harder with scale of course like David said you know sometimes if we're just deploying manually you know ultimately that gives us the most control which is good for us especially with how rapid we are iterating the the product now and I think yeah if you had more and more people joining the team you would have to then formalize those things a little bit. Same for code structure, though. In that sort of world, it might make sense to invest in that sort of service abstraction and solve some of the common problems, and then everyone can benefit from that. That isn't our situation, so those things would just be kind of technical extravagance, probably. Mm Mm-hmm. So you don't need a release manager? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, we don't need a release manager. Yeah, okay. We had it before. It's, it's not the case that we never had a release manager. We had it before in some, some time ago. But yeah. yeah, different sizes comes with different problems. Speed is different. That's why people 
try to put things like microservices, not because the microservices are better technology, because it's easier to control the size of the team or the responsibility, <laughs> things like that. In this case, it's, everything is easy in that sense because we are two people, but we became from uh, full stack developers to full company developers. We do support, we do marketing, we do <laughs> accountancy. So it's, it's not only... The tech stack is quite wide in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. you, you have to worry about a lot of more things in, in this case. Yeah, I remember that release manager wanted to do like two releases a month and then be in sync with everyone. And they asked how many times we were releasing. And, and it was that day was something between 10 and 20 or something. You know, it was a, a very different mindset of rapid. As soon as it's a bit better than it was, you know, we want to kind of get it out. And it's a kind of different culture because I think people have looked at us in the past and thought, a couple of cowboys here don't know what they're doing. Just releasing willy-nilly throughout the day whenever they feel like it. Um, but actually, if you're careful with that, it can be a great way to, I mean, if you, you know, for squashing bugs and things, the satisfaction of knowing that that bug is gone now because I've just seen it live, gone. And as long as you've got good test coverage that you feel confident then that you can just deploy very often, I think it's a great way to, to work. So with that type of release cycle, would you carry that same mindset over to something like Auto or Odo? That's a funny one, because the thing is that Auto project hasn't really changed much since we first put it out there. Okay. So let's say you're just doing another open source thing that people were importing and depending on in some capacity. Do you think that's something where like the overhead of getting new versions is higher, that it would make more sense to slow down the release cycles? Yeah, probably. And I think you hit it on the head. I think the point is it's about the audience of that thing. Yeah, if it was an open source project and people were writing to specific versions of it and things, I think that does change things quite a lot. You have different promises as well. I mean, David and I, we have a mono repo. So we have all of our code for the whole company is in one repository. Again, another thing culturally that sounds kind of shocking to some people. I know that Facebook do it, and I think Google even have this great big monorepo, although I'm sure they have now lots of other things on top of that too. But having a monorepo is nice because we can make breaking changes ourselves. Like if we break the API in the same commit or in the same pull request, it can contain the fixes for the front end. You know, we'll have all the generated code from the auto definitions, so they get all regenerated, so they're all new. And you, you basically advance the whole system in one go rather than, you know, having to then worry about versioning APIs or remaining backwards compatible, uh, things like this. You know that because it all deploys as one, we know that if, the, if that back end has gone out and it's updated, the front end that's being served is also updated and they kind of you know, tightly bound in that sense, in a safe way. So I think, yeah, there's other benefits to keeping things simple. That's another one. I think it's also important to note that sometimes that simplicity becomes problematic at scale. And the story that comes to mind for me is when I was at Google, they had a mono repo. And usually when you submit code, it would only test like your local, like things that your code affected is what would get tested. But then once it was sort of submitted, I forget how exactly it worked, but but essentially like everything would kind of get tested at that point to make sure it somehow didn't affect something that they didn't expect it to affect. Right. And all I remember is that at some point, some intern had somehow submitted something that literally broke everybody in the company's builds. So nobody could submit stuff for a short period of time. <laughs> and I felt bad because I'm just like, it was an honest, like one line change from the intern that somehow probably got forced in. But I can't imagine how many emails he got at that point from people like, hey, you're breaking my build. I can't get stuff submitted. And, you know, that that's like the downside to it is you can have some weird results that come from that. Mm. Yeah, at scale. I mean, that sounds like a nightmare. But I can't imagine that. Like you're working on something and you push some code and then it's like, okay, please wait, building Google Maps. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> the way it worked was kind of, I, I don't remember the exact, it's been so long. But all I remember is that it was like roughly something where like your dev process felt pretty quick because it didn't wait on all that. But eventually you kind of like get feedback later asynchronously that's like, oh, by the way, that, that deploy you did, you know, that build you did is not going to work because here's why. Mm. And you just kind of got used to that whole process of like going and doing something else. So I think some people, like you guys said, you weren't using continuous integration. 
But I think there are some companies that I'm sure some listeners have been in a company where you deploy a fix and, and running all the tests sometimes, especially integration tests, can take so long that it's really not worth sitting there and running them all for every single change. So you run the relevant unit tests and then you submit it and you go do something else while your continuous integration tool runs all those tests for you somewhere else. And I think it's kind of that mindset of, you know, as long as you're okay with that and you can swap what you're doing, that works well. Yeah, well, we're lucky because we are sometimes quite irritable easily. And so there's no way we would tolerate our tests being slow. We're quite reactionary sometimes, especially when there's emotional things. I mean, that sometimes like that's what will drive our day. If there's something in the app, because we, we dog food the app, so we're using it to build itself. We use it all the time. And if there's just something that bugs us in it, the discipline needed for us to not just jump on that and go and fix it, we basically don't really have it. Because it's those little things that annoy us that will annoy other people as well. So it's very important that the software doesn't annoy you and annoy us. So slow tests would be annoying and we would fix it. The other thing is we have some integration tests through peppered throughout the code, but we, do, we certainly don't have 100% integration, I mean, 100% unit test code coverage or anything like that. And that's because the code's all being tested through these integration tests. And really, they have to be quick because that's the same API that the front end is hitting. So again, because we're dog fooding it, our tests won't ever be slow. And if they do start to get slow, it means also that our app in the front end is also going to start getting slow. And then we've got different problems. We may want to fix them anyway. So in a way, yeah, it's nice that our testing uses the API because we'll get that feedback from it. If there are things that are just taking too long, it's going to be annoying us a lot more than annoying anyone else first. And we'll go and fix it. Did you not see value in having sort of full end-to-end -end testing? So rather than having the layer that the front end talks to, right, and which is what you're using in your integration testing, was it too complicated to actually have the front end drive the communication and seeing the whole thing uh, front to back? We did look at it. Um, I'm still open to it. But the answer is, yeah, it wasn't trivial. It wasn't easy to do. And so, yeah, we, it didn't happen. The other thing is, with UI testing, there are bits that are kind of perfect. They make sense if you take a status and you're going to turn that into a string or something, or you're going to describe a list of people, there are things like that that you can unit test quite nicely. But there isn't really a way to have a test for a good UX. So there's a lot of kind of untestable value and untestable code really in the front end. That was another thing that was quite interesting to sort of figure out when we start to think about that. Like, of course, we want to click this button and then this should show and then we're going to click this button. Those kinds of flows would be testable. But we want that to be a, a nice experience and that's more important probably than act, which actual buttons are being clicked or anything. And it's a harder thing to codify uh, and maybe impossible. So there's a lot of manual testing in the front end anyway, but I'm definitely open to, I've used some before, but not enough to be confident with, but there are tools that, that do headless browsers and things that do a very good job of simulating what real users will be doing. So along those lines, what is the sort of a, the makeup of your typical functionality from the time the front end um, triggers it to the number of things that are happening in the back end. So here's what I mean by that. For example, if you know you have for a user to be able to accomplish a task, right? The task may require multiple steps, right? So from the time the front end gathers all the information it needs to actually trigger that in the back end, are you relying on the front end to say, well, I'm going to trigger the, the first function call, the back end is going to perform that part, and then a response is going to come back. Now the front end is still tracking the state of the entire sort of a, a number of steps required to actually consider that one thing the user wants to do to be complete, right? So now the front end makes another call to trigger the second part of the step, you know, process with the back end and then a third and a fourth and whatever, right? So, or do you say, you know what, I'm going to gather everything, you know, you put logic, right, and a, a bunch of logic on the front end to then issue one call to the back end to do all the things, having gathered all the information. Like, are you front end heavy for logic or do you put all, most of your logic on the back end, basically? And that is another way you could rephrase that question. Interesting question. <laughs> so I'm not sure if answering your question, but we try to 
imitate in the test what the user will do or click in the front end. That means that it's going to do one request, wait for the response, do another request. For example, every time that our test starts, our user registered for using the app, creates an org, creates a team, for example. That's the basic three things that needs to do to be able to operate. It does it in every single integration test. It does, does three things. You can read it in every single integration test. Nothing else, nothing more. And when you need to do another functionality, you do those three things. Um, create a card. Wait for the card that is created. Assert that the that you have a card ID and do other operations. That's basically how how it's saved. It tries to imitate what you usually do in the front end but calling the, the API, the, the Go client to, to use the API. Yeah, we don't have too much of what you described, Johnny, where there's lots of different API calls have to happen for the UI to then be able to kind of continue the story or whatever. Because our API isn't a public API yet, you know, it's kind of tightly bound to the front end. And so that means we'll do things like we'll put all the data we need for a particular view in the response of one thing. There's one example where you could ask the team service for a team overview, and it will go and do all the work concurrently, actually, on the server to gather the information it needs. Hopefully, because of the data store choice, there'll be key information will be denormalized. So it's not going to have to go and look around the data store to gather up the, the answer. Hopefully, it's just going to one place or a couple of places to get the information and then put stitches it together and returns it all in one go to the front end so that the front end is somewhat uh, less sophisticated in that it can just take the data and then applies it essentially to a template. And that's the view experience. And that's nice because you can do things like, you know, it has live updates in there. So we have an event that can happen where the, all the connected browsers will notice this event. And we do this when something changes in a team. And then all of those browsers can then go and ask for an update and get the latest team overview, um, apply the changes, and then the tooling kind of diffs it and you essentially just see live updates happening in front of your eyes. And it's quite a nice flow. So I think if we were building a public API, we probably would have maybe more fine-grained API endpoints because there'd be more gen generic general purpose. Having said that, when I look through them, they kind of are that already just by chance, I think. There isn't much magic or complex stuff going on in the server. But when there is that, we try and do it in the server because we can test it better there. We're more comfortable in Go. We have strong types in Go. And, you know, we don't in JavaScript, things like that. Matt trying to say that we are much better Go developers than JavaScript developers, probably. Uh, doesn't recognize. I'm kind of the junior JavaScript developer. <laughs> and Matt is junior plus plus, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if you ever like, get out of the junior category in the JavaScript world. Not unless you dive in full time. <laughs> yeah. So one of the listeners on Twitter had asked if you guys were using GraphQL. And I assume that that means you're not because you don't really have a reason if you're returning everything you need already. Yeah, I think that's right. GraphQL, one of the nice things is people get to describe the data they need from a data store. And that saves a lot of, I suppose, resources and certainly bandwidth, and things like this. Although in practice, I've never found it to be that useful. You know, again, because I think in a lot of cases, we control the front end and the back end at the same time. And in those situations, you don't always get the benefit of these things. You don't really always see the benefit of the trade-offs you're making. But for us, yeah, it's just the RPC thing. I think we do have some handlers as well. Uh, like we have a handler for the initial index page of the app. But I think in production, because of the way you describe the app, that becomes static content. So App Engine actually distributes that to CDNs and things, and it gets served statically like properly statically. So in production, the Go thing is only handling the background pub sub tasks and those public facing API endpoint calls from the browsers. So you've mentioned your database being Firestore, I think is what you said. And you've mentioned pub sub for background tasks. 
So I want to talk more about those, but can you give like a quick overview of what your tech sec is? Because we haven't, I don't think we've fully like just walked over it briefly. Yeah. Okay. So we have Svelte in the front end. Svelte is like Vue and React and those in that you build these components. That's how you build the front end. You import components and you have events and properties just like you do in, in the other ones. The nice thing about Svelte is it's a kind of compile time build. So it or it does all of its heavy lifting at compile time. And that leaves you with kind of like how Go works, a, uh, a just a, a deliverable asset, essentially a JS file that is, uh, or everything's wired up inside it. It doesn't maintain a virtual DOM. If you change a variable name in React, there's other code has to run in the browser to then go and react to that and let other parts of the system know that. And in Svelte, it wires all that stuff up at compile time. So you don't get that runtime, which is kind of cool. I will say that Svelte is, is a little bit Go. It's, it's, we choose it because it reminds us, it has a lot of Go in, isn't it? Yeah, minimalist. It's deliberately cut down on the features. It doesn't try and do everything. But that means you can kind of learn the whole of Svelte uh, quite quickly and then that's everything you need to know then about uh, a system. So that's big benefits in that too, because obviously the learning curve's shorter, which was important for us. So Svelte, yeah, and that's running in the front end. We ha- we do have a UI kit CSS framework as well that we've then added our own CSS onto, and we use SCSS for that, for the compile time, so we can use variables and things. Uh, that all gets then built into static folders. That's then described in our app engine configuration file and we also mirror the same kinds of endpoints in the binary so like i said serving the static files we use the file server um, inside go for dev to do that but it's just the same it's just like hitting a certain path and it works then when it gets deployed app engine treats the static assets differently and um, and then we just root You'd use routing essentially in in a dispatch configuration file to tell it which paths go where. So you say this folder is all just static, so serve it statically. But these endpoints are going to hit our Go service, and then in there we have our Go server running on that port, waiting for those requests, and it just responds to the requests. It goes through that auto thing, so the translation between JSON and back is done. In our implementations, we're dealing with strongly typed generated code. So we can return errors. We have a response object that we can set the fields on and return it. You know, it's it's very familiar and very easy code to write and to maintain. And then there's the pub sub thing inside App Engine because like if if you make a comment, uh, you make a comment on something, we save that comment immediately. And then we re- reply and say, okay, it's done, carry on. So that makes the UI very snappy. But there's work to do after the fact. So if there's five people in this conversation, we're going to go and let those five people know that there's a new comment. Um, we don't want to do that and make the user wait while we're doing that. So then we use PubSub to kick that off into a background task. The background task can then kind of take as long as it wants to go and do the little bits, uh, notifications in that case. There's other examples where we use PubSub. And David, isn't that it? That's more or less the entire thing. Yeah, database with Firestore and, and that's it. We don't have much. We put some data to BigQuery to just back up some, do some sort of analytics to see how many people are using it, basically. That's it. For now, it's, it's just pretty simple architecture. <laughs> Hi everyone, panelist John Calhoun here. As many of you know, when I'm not recording Go Time episodes, I create programming courses. Some of these are paid, and that keeps the lights on at my house, so thank you to anyone who has purchased one of those. But I also offer free courses. One of those free courses is Gopher Sizes. It's a series of 20 Go programming exercises, and in each exercise we build something new or improve upon something we built in a previous exercise. Each exercise is designed to teach you something unique about Go, and they're also a lot of fun. So if you want to check it out, you can do that at gophersizes.com slash go time. That's G-O-P-H-E-R-C-I-S-E-S dot com slash go time. 
Or you can think of it as gopher plus exercises mashed together into one word because that's where it came from. So how do you deal with sort of uh, um, failures, right? So basically you have a situation where a user makes a comment, you reflect the comment, you know, in on the page. So as far as the user is concerned, the application uh, responded very quickly. Great UX. They're on about their business. But now you have an asynchronous operation, right, that is going to come out, right, and, you know, with a success or failure, right? It's going to say everything goes well, great. But in, in the case where something doesn't go well, how do you then relay that to the user, right? How do you then um, get notified of that error so you can perhaps ask the user to try again or something like that? So once the comment is paused and is okay to the user, it's basically okay to the user. We don't report it back. So if the pops up uh, fail for some reason, it has an inbuilt mechanism to do retries. And we check if the error is retriable or temporal or retriable. If it's retriable, we try again for a certain number of times till if it's success or not. If it's not success, we report it back to a stack driver. That is the way that G Cloud has it to report errors. So myself and, and Matt get an email that, oh, a new error come up. Can you please have a look? We probably say no. We have a look later. We have other things to do. But eventually, one of us, we pick up the error and see, oh, what's going on? Is something permanent that we can fix, we can improve. And there is a lot of trial and error on that. Sometimes when we are developing, oh, this is very important, I'm going to log and report. And once you try it, real users are using it and fails once, fails twice, fails 100 times. It's not a big deal. It's recoverable. Oh, why I put that log sentences like report in the first time? So you just remove it or improve it or do it as you go. You just continuous improve that, that process. But basically, that's the flow. It's also not very complicated, but it's something that you have to continuously revisit. Especially, we released a couple of weeks ago or even a week ago. We've been using the product for a while ourselves. One thing that we did a few months ago is turn off Slack, turn off any other project manager tool, and use Pace, in this case, full-time, for building it and for working on it. And we tried intensively, but we didn't catch up all the edge cases. Where the first day that we tried, we have some people just, oh, I do this and it fails and I lots of errors around. You, you never catch all the cases. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a matter of, of trying to do your best, trying to retry the, if the error is retriable, uh, log it and report it to see, to analyze it after a while when you have few samples and decide that error, you should keep it, you should improve it, or you just leave it. Yeah, that comment is a great example because if the delivery, essentially we note there's a notification that gets created for each person in a conversation. If one of those fails to get created, because it's a comment and it's a conversation, probably someone else is going to say something after. And then that's going to then be kind of telling everyone about that and so people are going to be caught up in that particular case it's not the end of the world if that particular message fails and I think having a kind of grown-up view on when this fails we just expect everything will at some point fail when this fails what's the worst thing that can happen and you can design the system with certain properties and idempotence or idempotency is one I always mention which is essentially this idea that no matter how many times you run the operation, the end result's the same as if you just ran it once. So that, as a just a simple idea, if you design a system knowing that, for example, the unique ID for a comment or somebody's interest in, a, say, a piece of work or a conversation, somebody's interest in that, the ID for that is deterministic. It contains the ID of the target thing that you're talking about and the user's ID. And so if the user was to click lots of times of being like interested and not interested, you can kind of toggle it in the UI. If the user were to click that and we didn't have any sort of debounce protection, that could end up with in being lots of messages in the system 
Some of them could be lost and things. But because the result of any one of those working puts the state in the kind of same place as if one of them did, like if I switch on interest and by mistake that generates three messages saying Matt is interested in this, because that idea is deterministic and it's the same kind of interest, the net result is it may just put the same record three times. That's the worst thing that can happen. Versus if it was just, say, adding to an array or something, you could imagine it could add three times to that array, and that's then not idempotent. So some things when it comes to design, I think we've, we have a lot of experience of building various systems. I mean, David doesn't like me saying things like this, but he worked on a project for the Olympics, you know, which is massive scale. And uh, think about all the messaging that's going on in a system that's there to support the Olympics. And you're not, you can't say to them the week before, can we just have a quick pre-Olympics, everyone? I just want to make sure that this code's going to work. Uh, you know, uh, they, they said no when he asked. <laughs> so yeah, then you think, okay, so let's assume it's going to fail. We'll design for that. And you can kind of build systems that are somewhat self-healing. And it's really kind of amazing to see these things just... Yes, we, we'll see error reports, but by the time we go and look, it's sort of self-healed because just because of the design of it, which is kind of really interesting, I think. This sort of leads into my next question, which is uh, sort of you're using a basically a non-relational um, data store, and that means you can't easily sort of join things and, and provide sort of uh, the latest and greatest you know, to the user. So do, do you factor in some sort of eventual consistency model to sort of the data you're returning? So to use a comment case again, if a user makes a comment and because you are capturing a uh, name and, and picture and all that stuff, you know, you capture all the different bits, right? You just store all that, right? The same object, if you will then that means that there's a potential there. And if you, the user does that you know, a number of times, right, you, you're copying that data you know, multiple times. So if the user ever changes their name or their avatar, right, how do you sort of uh, remediate, right? How do you resolve um, that across all the different copies of that data you've made? It's kind of best effort. So there are some times that you should do it and sometimes that you just show it as historic data, isn't it? If you bring commenting mm. it's not a bug it's a feature <laughs> yeah exactly it's like oh this is the story what you did in with your old name and this is you change your name it's fine you, you, you the new things you have it with the new name or new profile picture or whatever you use it as a new isn't it it's like kind of original blockchains <laughs> if we say it that works pretty well sometimes in that case probably nobody's going to complain that oh, all cards display with all the information about me. It really depends. But in other cases, we struggle to issue updates to just, oh, if you rename, we have, for example, tags or labels for categorize the, the cards and the message. So if you rename one, could be it ideal that it renames all the tags, even if it's their normalized. So in that case, it's more complex. What you need to do is just, instead of try to do it at read time, just issue a background job and trying to do it offline and, and deal with the eventual inconsistency for the time that it takes the background job to execute. You're going to have a little time that is just, some of them is changed, some of them not. So so you, you have to accommodate the UX experience to have the best experience of that. But this is just a trade-off. You sacrifice reading for writing and you sacrifice writing for reading. So it's, it's not a good solution for, for everything. You just need to design your application accordingly. You probably do some mistakes in both cases. When you have joins, you have the problem, oh, I, I made too many joins. When I thought it was one join, it was just the M plus one problem and I, I joined the whole database to, to just get one view and, and that's exactly the same problem. It's just a question of trade-offs more than than anything. One of the nice things is we are acting really in the product role and the technical at the same time. And in the past, when I've worked at places where they've separated those functions out, and that, that creates a lot of friction because you then have a situation where you've got somebody who the product person, they're fighting for the best possible product. 
And of course, the engineering are fighting with the realities of the engineering that they've already done and they understand. And you get this kind of tension. And there often a lot of work and a lot of effort and energy goes into just resolving that sort of conflict. And you end up hopefully with the situation where you've got something that's good for users, it fits technically, and everyone's happy. Often you don't have that. And what's nice about, since we both fulfill those two f- functions separately, or rather we, we're kind of fulfilling them at the same time, we kind of get to think about what's the user experience we want with the realities of the system. And that allows us to if not always design the perfect thing, at least we go after the things that we know that we can do a good job on. So that's helped us, I think, have something that's usable so soon, even though it's really just two of us building it. I think it's also worth noting that like for our, our listeners who you know might not be familiar with both like a SQL database that has these joins versus a, a document store that you sort of denormalize data and copy it over, that problems exist on both sides of the table. Like both sides will have their own separate similar problems. I guess the one that comes to mind is, let's say you're shipping your Amazon, you're shipping packages to a user and they have an address and you have it in a relational database where you like, you know, query the user and do a join with their address and pull the address up. But if the user goes and edits an address and changes it, depending on how you stored the database, you need your historical records to show the correct address you ship to. So at that point, you need to, like, you have to think about the same type problems of, well, okay, now the user can't change their address, they have to create a new one. And is that the you know the use case you want? So I definitely think that there's that problem on both sides of it. It's just a matter of finding the right balance. Yeah, it's true. I think you're at risk of not being as rapid. when If you use just a SQL data store, you can prototype and you can sort of throw data in and query it in different ways. You can do a lot more of that. Having said that, I haven't found that our creativity has in any way been stifled by having a a schemaless data store. But it is quite strict. Like with Firestore, if you want to do a query that even if you're doing an order by one field and filtering on another field, you need a dedicated index for that. So you need dedicated index for every kind of query you're going to be doing, essentially. It creates by default single field ones for you and you then... Your job is to go and exclude any you're not going to need. But having that, that's quite strange initially because you used to, if you want to just rapidly prototype in the browser and build things, to some extent you have to know ahead of the time what it is you're going to get out of the data store, more so than with other technologies. But honestly, it hasn't slowed us down at all. And of course, the trade-off is if you go to pace.dev, if you actually play with it and use it, it's lightning fast and it'll stay fast because of the nature of uh, th- that choice. The reason why that data store is so limited is so that if you use it properly, you can deliver massive power. And so that's it. You're right. It's just about the trade-off. There isn't a technology that just solves all your problems. You know, there's always going to be decisions that you have to make and you're making them at the wrong time. You make them at the beginning, which is the wrong time. You're much better off making decisions at the end if you can. But of course, you've got to do something, meanwhile. Unpopular opinion. Unpopular opinion. David, Matt, do either of you have an unpopular opinion you'd like to share? Is pairing with Matt an unpopular opinion? <laughs> Well, it's one of the things that we usually do when meanwhile we are praying. We just Matt gets the guitar and we try to do something completely different and build a little song or something like that. Yeah, just do some songwriting instead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but actually an unpopular opinion I have is you know, you should try and work in tiny teams. A lot of the problems when it comes to software engineering come at scale. And that's not just code scale, but people scale. So if you can have tiny little teams working on a problem, and you can do this within bigger teams, like just literally as uh, you know, two or three people, you are now a new little team. You can be so effective in such a small group because you cut out a lot of the work needed really to marshal the team. You can't always do it. And it sounds a little bit antisocial, but that would be my unpopular opinion. Tiny teams. 
Do you have an unpopular opinion, David? I don't have a unpopular opinion. I'm I'm very populist, probably. <laughs> <laughs> go with the flow. You'd probably have to be go with the flow to work with Matt that much. <laughs> oh man. I know I'm getting a grill in on this. I'm just kidding. Yeah, 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 we kinda warned you though. You knew this was coming. Yeah, but if you knew <laughs> David. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's what I'm about to say. It's like you don't know me. I'm I'm congratulating Mike for working with me for a while. Also. So are you telling us that like he turned his camera, we see a blank wall right now, but really if he turns it the other way, it's a bunch of unpopular, I don't know, posters <laughs> or something. No, it's all right. I usually tell Matt that he's a terrible developer. He he just <laughs> Our ideas is are bad, so I'm, I'm not sure why he's working with me. Yeah. yeah, I didn't. I thought it was a language thing when you would say <laughs> that my ideas are a, ter- a terrible idea. I thought that was just language, but no, no. It turns out he does think that, and he will tell you. <laughs> is that why you spend so much time trying to prove him wrong? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Actually, the serious point of just sort of honesty about things is a big short when you want to be rapid as well you know no one wants to hurt anyone's feelings but if you can very quickly just have like very open and honest discussion about things i think it does does save a lot of time i suspect a lot of that comes with working like small teams helps but partially in the sense that you're probably working with similar people every time so you build a good relationship and trust and like when somebody says i don't agree with this I, I guess it almost feels like you don't have to worry about hurting their feelings as much or worry about, like, people trust each other more, I guess, in those senses. Yeah. Well, I've worked in places where that's how I've always been, just completely honest about it. And then, you know, because that's the idea, right? We'll all just put the best ideas out and we can all, all figure it out as a sort of team. And a few times in my career, that's hurt me where I've just been doing that and I've been p- kind of politically tone deaf to other things going on um you know and i've just been quite naive about it just sort of getting on with it so yeah i then was a little bit got a bit sensitive about that because it is important that you know you want to make sure that the ideas are there but there are people that t- t- hold their ideas very personally and will feel personally attacked if you disagree with the ideas and stuff so it's it's definitely worth watching out for but it is nice being in a situation where that's um less of a consideration and you can sort of just focus on the important bits you're right it's about the trust thing and getting to know each other i think getting to know your teammates yeah it's 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 definitely about the trust so i'm kind of trust mad and i can say oh if this looked terrible i dislike this completely or something like that it doesn't get hurt but don't forget that when you communicate in open source when you're workmates you try to be exactly the opposite, isn't it? You try to just be polite, try to be respectful, and that's kind of the the healthy way to do it. We we get so much reports, issue reports. You can, I don't know about you, but you you can feel the tongue in in the words, in in the written words, in many issues, and and you know when something doesn't smell right in, in, in the tongue, in, in messages or when something something is wrong. Even uh, trying to be honest, we try to be very, very clear and very re- respectful in, in, in that way. Every time that we write to public communication or to each other, we try to, to maintain that. Apart from joking or healthy behaviors in a team that is also quite fun to do, we also try to do it with up to the best standards like if we do it in a normal team or with people that we didn't work together yet or if we're gonna hire someone we probably do the same all right well matt david thank you for sharing about pace.dev with us for anybody who wants to check it out you can find it at pace p-a-c-e dot d-e-v if you want to hear more about why matt named it that you can uh, or matt and david both i suppose you can message them on twitter as well Johnny, also thank you for joining. My pleasure. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. That's our show. Thanks for listening. If you want to hear more from Matt and David about Pace, I invited them on JS Party to talk about Svelte and the front end. Never heard of JS Party? 
It's the greatest JavaScript-focused podcast that records live on Thursdays on the entire Changelog network of shows. Matt Ryer himself called it the best party he'd been to in 10 weeks, and I promise he did not follow that praise with a snarky reference to the COVID lockdown. I'll link the episode up in the show notes for easy click-ins. Give it a listen. Thanks to John Calhoun and Johnny Borsico for hosting this episode, to Breakmaster Cylinder for all of our beats, to our longtime sponsors Fastly, Linode, and Rollbar, and to you for making all of our work worth the effort. Please do tell a friend about GoTime. We truly appreciate you spreading the word. That's all for now. Postgres next week. If I Google blew the world away because, you know, the, the search engines before that kind of were like steam engines. They were so bad. Yeah. I remember Alta. Jeeves. I would ask yeah. Jeeves all kinds of things and he'd never know any of it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Alta like, Vista. Yeah. Alta Vista. Uh, web. What, web. What was the web one? It had the actual spider as its logo. Web crawler. Web. Oh, yeah. Sp- I don't remember. I don't know. It was I a dog. Remember the spider. Oh. Ask Jeeves just confused me because... Like, first off, search was already bad, and they're like, now we're going to try to process, like, natural language from questions and and use that for search. And I'm like, (laughs) how is this going to get any better? You just made the problem (laughs) twice as hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's why portals were so big, because search was so bad. So you just go to yahoo.com, and they would be your portal to the internet. Because Yeah, when you could browse it. Remember when you could browse just a directory of the internet? The whole of the internet. Pretty much. (laughs) It's like one page of links. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, back in the days when I used to be called a webmaster. Mm. Oh, webmaster, yeah. Yeah, don't judge me. I still kind of want that to be my, my email. The webmaster. Just webmaster. At. <laughs> webmaster. That's funny. Good times. The good old days.